So welcome back. This is discrete optimization, constraint programming, and this is part seven. Okay, so I'm very excited about this lecture because it's still about redundant constraints, but it's going to be about one of the first beautiful models that I wrote with Helmut Simonis, and I will tell you the story later on. Okay, but we are still in redundant constraints and expressing how you can actually put these new constraints that will prune the search space much more. Okay, so this is actually a real example that I'm going to talk about. It's about car sequencing. Okay, so what you see there is an assembly line for cars. And you have to understand how this works. So in practice, you know, when you produce these cars, they are on this assembly line that is moving in front of production unit. Okay, so these production units are responsible for actually putting options on the car. And an option can be, you know, leather seats on moon roof. But a production unit have to go fast because essentially the, the cars are moving. And so they have a capacity constraint, which is essentially telling, telling you know, the, 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 the people assembling the line how many options, on how many cars they can put this option in a row. Okay? So for instance, they may have a constraint that tells you, you know, at most two out of five successive cars you know, can require a moon roof because otherwise the production unit won't have the time to actually put it on. Okay, so essentially what you have is a huge amount of cars that you have to produce, okay, it's typically in the number of hundreds, okay, and you have these capacity constraints on the production unit, these different cars, the different configuration of the various options, and you have to sequence them such that all these capacity constraints are satisfied. So let me show you an example. This is an example of, this is an instance of that problem, okay, so what you saw here on top are the various configurations of car that you need to produce. Now, every time you see a yellow, that means this, this is a particular option which is required. So you can assume that the first option there is a moon roof, the second one is a leather seat, and so on and so forth. The tiny numbers that you see there, it's not important what they are, but that they basically the number of cars requiring that particular configuration. What you see at the bottom is very interesting, okay? So that's the assembly line, okay? So the capacity that you see there are the capacity of the various production unit. The first one there is one out of two. That basically means that every other car cannot require that option. You wouldn't have the time to actually put it on, okay? The next one is uh, one out of three. That means out of three successive car, uh, well, it's actually two out of three. Out of three successive car, most two can take the option. And the last one is one out of five, okay? So if you take five successive slots, at most one car can actually be scheduled there. So for every one of these constraints, this is actually a legal sequencing you know, of, of all the cars. If you, you know, in for the first row, if you take, select you know, two, two, um, two successive slots, only one of them will be yellow. For the last one, if you take any kind of five successive slots, a window of five successive slots, there will be only one car requir requesting that option. Okay? So your goal is to take all these things at the top and produce what is at the bottom and make sure that every one of these capacity constraints is actually satisfied. Okay, so how do we do that? This is a simple example that I will use for illustrating some of the propagation and some of the properties at the end. So it's good to familiarize ourselves a little bit with it. So what you see there are the various classes of car that we have to produce. On top are the options, okay? So this is class one. Class one is gonna require option one, option three, and option four, okay? And the demand for that particular car is one. So the last one that you see there, this is class six. Okay, it requires option one, option two, and you need to produce uh, two cars of that type. Okay, now these are the production units for every one of the, of the option. Okay, so look at this option here. This is option five. This is one out of five. Once again, window of five slots, only one car of that type. Okay, so that's the example that I will use later on. Okay, so this is the model. Okay, it's a beautiful model. Uh, so what you have there is first a set of data. You have the slots. That's basically you know all the slots of the assembly line. You have the various configuration that you see on the top. That's you know, the, the type of car that you have to produce. The various options. You know moon moon roof. You know leather seats and so on. The demand for every one of these configuration. That's how many cars you have to produce. You have a lower bound and an upper bound for every one of the options. You know lower bound means when you have a constraint two out of five, the lower bound would be two. The upper bound would be five. Now, the interesting decision variables here are the line variables. So that essentially for every slot of the assembly line, okay, that decision variable will tell you what type of car you have to produce there. Okay? Now, we use a set of auxiliary variables here, which are the setup uh, variable. And setup OS essentially is going to be one when option S is required on slot S of the assembly line. So that basically means that the, the, the car, which the, the type of car which is scheduled on slot S, S2 re requires that a particular option. Okay. Now we strictly don't need these variables, but they make it easy to state the constraints. Okay. 
So then you see the constraints. The first one is uh, the capacity constraints that you're going to see there, okay? the demand constraints. And that particular constraint is basically telling you, well, if you have a particular type of car, you have to produce enough car of that particular type. Okay, so and the way you do it is exactly as in the magic series example. Okay, so you basically count the number of occurrences of that type, that type of car in the line, and the summation has to be equal to the demand of that type of car. The next constraint is very easy. Okay, what it, what it basically defines are the setup variables that I talked about before. Okay, so setup of OS is going to be equal to the value of requires, which is part of the data, okay, of O and the, and the type of car which is scheduled at slot S of the assembly line. So in a sense, that's the decision variable. Once we know the value, in a sense, we'll know what type of car, and then we can compute the setup variables for that particular car. And then the last constraint is basically the capacity constraints for the production unit. I won't go into the detail, but essentially what you do is you take these time windows, okay, of, you know, uh, upper bound slot, that's why you see the upper bound uh, somewhere here, okay? And then what you want to make sure is that at most the lower bound, you know, uh, they, they are at most the number of lower, the, the, the value of the lower bound cars that you produce of that type. And that's what this constraint is basically expressing, okay? So you take the setup variable, you sum them for a windows of five, and that has to be smaller or equal to the lower bound. You know, two out of five, at most two out of five, you would make sure that this is smaller than two. Okay, so that's the model, okay? So it uses a lot of the feature of constraint programming, reify constraints, element constraints, and then these sums over there, okay? And so this is a little bit how the system is working, right? So you see, as soon as you place a card, this is type one, okay? So you know that since the demand is one, you will only produce one of these type, and of course there is no other car that can be scheduled at that slot, okay? Now what is interesting to see is what is happening to the option, okay? So you know that class one over there, okay, is requesting option one, three, and four, okay? And that's what you see there, right? The blue stuff is basically telling you that the car you know, that slot is requiring option one, three, and four, okay? And then what you see, which is interesting, is already the propagation of some of the values, right? So this is how you get from an element constraints, of course, you know, we don't require option uh, five. And then you see also the capacity constraints there. We know that the production, the, cap the, pr the capacity constraints on that production unit is one out of three. So if this car, the first car requires option three, we know that the next two, the next two slots cannot require option three. Okay? And so this is essentially these two constraints basically acting as soon as you are actually giving a value to a particular variable. This constraint is actually uh, already acting as well because it, may, it remove all the other, it makes sure that none of the other slot can be assigned of a, a, a car of type one. Okay? Now, uh, this is more propagation that I'm gonna show you, okay? So, you know, this is the demand constraints that I told you about. That's why these values were removed, okay? And then you see this is very interesting what is happening here, okay? So what you have been deducing here is that you cannot have a car of class five and six on the second slot. And the reason is because option one, right? So you see option one over here, okay? So option one, I know that I cannot take option one. That's what I see uh, over there, okay? I cannot take option one there because of the one out of two constraints. And essentially that tells you which, this is telling you which car are actually uh, requesting option one. And of course you have class, you have class uh, five and six over here, okay? And therefore you can remove these guys from consideration for the slot, for the, for, for the, inside, the, inside, the var inside the values of the assembly line. Okay, so you made that deduction and you made a similar deduction here for class fights for the third slot over there. Okay, so once again, all this propagation is being done by the system behind the scene. Okay, now, so we have these beautiful examples that I talked about the first time we ran this example. You know, I, rem I still remember it. You know, Elmut and I were looking at this screen and we had this beautiful assembly line and the system would produce this car almost to the end. And then, just when it was about to reach the solution, it would backtrack and come back. And then it would do that for, you know, half an hour. And we were like, ah, why isn't it never finding a solution? Okay. And then we started analyzing, looking at the screen for hours at a time. Okay. And what we realized is that the system was actually doing something pretty stupid. Actually, the model was pretty stupid. We wrote a bad model. And, but we did use a very important feature of these constraints. So, cons and so this is what we found, found out. Okay. So consider an option O and assume that its capacity is two out of three and that I have to produce 12 cars. Okay. This is my assembly line. I have to produce 12 cars out of every three slots I can produce at most two. Okay, so what do I know? Okay, 
So I know that in the last three slots, I can only produce two cars. Okay? So that I know. And therefore, what do I know? I know also, so I can produce only these two cars on the last two slots. Okay? So what do I know? What do I have to produce in the beginning? Well, I have to produce 10 cars in the beginning. So I know that I have at least to produce these 10 cars because if I don't, I won't find a solution. And that's what the system was doing. It was putting car, no, not putting the car, not putting the car, and it was coming here and scrambling around trying to put these cars, but it couldn't. Okay? So now I know that I have to put at least 10 cars in this particular, in this particular part of the assembly line. Okay, so what else can I deduce? Well, I can do exactly the same reasoning, right? So I can deduce that I can almost put two cars over there, therefore I have to produce eight cars over there, and I can continue the reasoning. So I'm deducing a lot of constraints on the assembly line. For every one of these portions of the assembly line, I know how much car I can produce and I have to produce. Okay? Now, is it easy to actually add these constraints? Yes, it's very easy. Essentially, what you're doing here is counting. It's just the same kind of constraints that we did for expressing the capacity constraints. But this time around, what I know is that I'm putting a constraint which is not limiting the number of cars by above, I'm actually limiting the number of cars by below. And so what you see here is a constraint where essentially, at, you know, I'm iteratively looking at larger and larger portion of the assembly line, okay? Uh, actually, smaller on the left, larger on the right, okay? And for every one of them, I'm basically deducing, you know, how much I can produce on the right side and make sure that the left side is producing enough. So I'm basically taking the lower bound multiplying by i and taking the upper bound multiplying by i as well when I am actually limiting the, 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 search of the, the, the slots that I'm considering. Okay? Now that constraint was really powerful. When we actually run the model like this, it would find all the solutions to the benchmark that we had very quickly. And you can see why, right? So this is the assembly line, okay? So I'm placing the second queen and I'm starting using information, okay? Uh, the, second, the second car and I'm placing it there, okay? So once again, I remove value. I'm propagating some of these constraints over there. I know that I need this option. This is two out of five. I remove some value, okay? So I did use a lot of values like this, okay? And then I can remove some more values using this particular options that you see there, right? So this is once again option number four. I know that I can't take, I, 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 you know, I, I have information of this. I use this particular option to use more values, and this is what I do, okay? And then essentially the, the very interesting thing happens here, okay? So look at this, okay? I have to produce two cars of these three classes, okay? And these cars are actually, you know, all using option two. Okay, so in option two, I know that I have to produce six cars. Okay, now look at the assembly line and option two here. Okay, what do I know? Well, I know that I can at most, at most, put two in here. Okay, so which basically means that, you know, in the first part of the assembly line, I have to put four. Okay, once again, I play the same trick. In these first three slide, uh, slots, I can at most put two, and then essentially at the rest, I have also to put two. Okay, at, le at, mo at least two. This was at most, this is at least. Okay, now look at this tiny thing here. Okay, so I have two slots and I have to produce at most two. Well, that's easy, right? I have to put these things over there. Okay, if I put two over there, okay, this is a two out of three, so I cannot put that one. Now I have to put two in this thing and there are only two slots, I put them. And then essentially all the options, you know, uh, all the various options for this, all the particular value for this option have been fixed at this time. Now I can start propagating that information above, and this is what you are seeing here, okay? So tremendous, tremendous reduction of the search space, okay? So that constraint, essentially, that what we did was basically doing two things. It was basically looking at the capacity constraints on the line. It was basically looking at the demand constraints, merging these two to actually derive a new property of the solution. And then, essentially, what happened is that the search space would be dramatically reduced. Okay, and the system would find solution very, very quickly. Okay, so you see it's continuing. This thing just propagates at this point on its own, right? It will never stop. Okay, so what we did here is essentially taking two constraints and merging them for improving the communication between them. Okay, so so, the various, so let me summarize what we have seen so far. So we have seen various ways of improving the communication. One of them is actually introducing global constraints. You merge two constraints, okay? Another way is actually adding a redundant constraint. That's what you have seen. 
Then we could add surrogate constraints, so that's merging two constraints, you know, for instance, taking a linear combination of them, adding a new one. And then imply constraints is, is just what I talked to you about now, is you take two constraints and you derive a property from them. Okay? So that's all the ways we can actually exploit the various, the, various, uh, the various constraints that you have and combine them to actually improve the communication. Okay? Let me talk about one last thing, which is dual modeling, which is essentially pushing this idea to the extreme. Okay? So sometimes you look at a particular problem and you have different way of modeling it and you don't know which one is the best. Okay? So you don't have the same decision variable, you don't express the constraint in the same way. So what do you do? Well, in constraint programming, one of the nice things you can do is just not bother. You essentially put the two models inside the system. Okay? It's too hard to choose between them. It's, you know, some constraints are naturally expressed in one and not in the other one. Just put the two models and connect them in some fashion. Okay? So essentially, the basic idea of dual modeling is that if you have several ways of modeling a problem, put them in, link them through constraints, and see what you get. Okay? Because you will exploit the strengths of both models. Or you know, if you have three, you could put three. Okay? So let me show you a very, very simple example of that. You know, we come back to the Queen's problems that we're starting from in the first, in the first two lectures on constraint programming. The, you know, I told you at that time that there were many modeling of you know, the eight queens problem. And one of them was to associate a column, uh, associate a queen for every column, and the decision variable would denote the row. And that's one modeling, okay? And then essentially the constraint would say, oh, you know, you know the, the queens cannot be on the same row, upper diagonal, lower diagonal. Here is another modeling, okay? So instead of us assigning a queen to every column, I assign a queen to every row. Okay? I have a completely different model. Now I'm reasoning about the row. And of course, you know, the, you know, the queens on the row cannot be on the same column. And once again, you will have diagonal constraints. Okay, let me show you the model. This is the model. Okay? Two sets of variables now. Okay? You will see the row variables and the column variables. Okay? The row variables are basically for every column. It specifies you know, the row on which the queen is going to be placed. The column variable, okay? So for every row, it's going to specify the column on which the queen is placed. Okay? And then you see the constraints here. The constraints are on the two sets of variables. They are exactly the same, you know, kind of. Right? Some are on the row, some are on the column, but they're really, really the same. Okay? And then the really, important, the really important part is the last constraints that you see there. And that part is essentially connecting the two models. So you have the row model so far, you have the column model over there, but they are not connected. This makes them connected. So from what you learn from the model is going to be transferred into the other and vice versa. How are they connected? They are connected by these constraints. What is this constraint saying? Take a row, take a column. Okay? So if we know that the row of column C is R, it has to be the case that the column of R is equal to C. Okay? And of course, vice versa, vice versa. If you know that the column of R is C, it has to be the case that the row of C is R. Okay? So in a sense, every time I learn something about the row, I'm going to learn something about the column okay? and vice versa. Okay? So in a sense, I get not only the propagation of both of these models, but I have information which, which propagates you know, from one model to the other one, which can start new deduction on one of them, and which can start you know, also deduction to the other one through this particular constraint. That's it. Thank you.